How's it going, everybody? This is Beat the Bush. This is the Red Odeo 12 volt, 200 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. Today, I'm going to do something a little different than straight review of this battery. I'm going to talk about the manufacturer of this battery, what you should do with lithium iron phosphate batteries, and lastly, if this is something you should be buying if you're thinking about building a large battery bank. When you get these in the mail, it comes in a cardboard box. There's foam padding everywhere, and it comes in a plastic sleeve with all this documentation in it. The product manual, a sticker sheet, it also comes with some terminal screws and some terminal covers. Interestingly, I reviewed two other batteries where the packaging were almost identical. The shape and industrial design of the mold appears almost identical, except with a different branding, different stickers on it. This particular industrial design of the plastic shell itself appears to be very, very familiar. And these two are the packets that come with a different battery. Notice how the sleeve is the exact same thing, except with a different logo on it. When you look at some of the graphic, it's also very, very similar. Now, this is what they call an OEM product. You have companies that contract out manufacturers and they give them certain specifications on what to do in order to manufacture the product. And from what I can tell from all the teardowns of these batteries is that they can be very, very specific on what they want in the battery. For example, they can select what kind of color the lid is, what kind of color the bottom box is, possibly what kind of cell to put in, what size and what manufacturer BMS to put in. They can select what kind of sticker to put in. All the graphics they could design themselves. So by the time you get it as a customer, it's completely customized and the performance would be very, very different. You can have a very, very different product with different reliabilities and different performance just based on the specifications. Now, with that said, I did some tests on this. This charging at 150 amps, I got a total of 209 amp hours of energy. This is around 5% over the rated capacity, so the capacity is verified. I drained it down to around 10.7 volts, so pretty low, 10 volts being the absolute maximum. I can probably squeeze another one or two amp hours out of this, but let's just leave it at that. It's over the rated capacity. Then I went to charge it back up at 40 amps. Then able to stuff in 206 amp hours. I'm using this charger right here. It stops around 14.6 volts. Where it exactly stops depends on the accuracy of the voltage measurement. I think as long as I get 200 amp hours or more discharging and charging, I'm pretty happy with it. So now I'm gonna discharge it at 200 amps, maybe go a little bit over and see if it cuts it off. This is a 3000 watt inverter, so I can definitely go beyond the 200 amps. I have a power bank that can draw you know, 1400 watts or so right here. So from that one, we can do about 125 amps. And then I have another power bank that can vary the wattage charging. So let me plug that one in. Now we have 140 amps. We can increase the charging rate, bump it up all the way to 180. Let's go a little bit further, 190. It's doing about 2.5 kilowatt at less than 200 amps. It should be able to run continuously, never cut itself off or anything. But if we go a little bit beyond that, let's go to start the timer, 217 amps. It's about 10% over. It can do 400 amps of discharge for five seconds. So if it's significantly lower, it will last a bit longer than that. It appears it's not measuring the amperage that's going over. Rather, it's probably waiting for something to heat up too much and then cut itself off. After four minutes, it still hasn't cut off, so I'm gonna increase the load a little bit more to 3000 kilowatt, which is the limit of my inverter here. And now we're reaching 233 amps. We'll let it run and see if I can trip this battery into cutting itself off. I might actually be able to drain the entire battery at 220 amps. It's been 10 minutes already. I probably need a five kilowatt, 12 volt inverter just to push these things to their limits. Yep, still at three kilowatt. Cables are very, very hot. Red cable is at 183 degrees, black cable 140 degrees, almost too hot to touch. The resistor is at 330, I probably should stop this test. With the equipment I have, I can't even push this into cutoff. This cable is two gauge, so I probably need a zero gauge or double zero gauge in order to push it to 400 amps. So I'm gonna stop this test for now, but after 10 minutes or so, everything's just getting too hot. I have to stop this test. Pretty nice, you can push it 200 
250 amps for long duration. There are some things I want to cover in their manual that's very important. First, take a look at the CC and CV charge curve. If the voltage is very low, it's going to try to dump in as high a current as it can sustain. So this is the CC mode, which stands for constant current. During this phase, it's willing to accept as much energy as you can provide it via the charging. So let's say you're providing it 40 amps and it keeps on charging, the voltage keeps on ramping up steadily until it reaches a certain point. For this particular battery, it's 14.6 volts. So as soon as you reach this voltage, it's going to try to not increase it any further. The charger does this by gradually reducing the amount of current that's going into the device. If you let off a little bit in how much current you put in, the voltage will gradually go down. So if you kind of throttle the amount of current you put in, you can essentially keep the voltage around 14.6 volts. This is the CV mode, which means for constant voltage. The current gradually goes all the way down and that's what you see in this current curve it goes all the way down to 0.02 c which is around four amps and then it goes okay you're charging at less than four amps we're just going to cut the entire thing off and call it completely full that is how a lithium iron phosphate charger charges this kind of batteries now let's talk about estimating how much capacity is left in this battery just based on voltage you can read at the terminal outputs. Here's a chart on capacity versus the voltage that you can read. I laminated this thing because it's so handy and it gives you a voltage for 3.2 volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, and 48 volts. These are the most common voltages I work with when combining these batteries. The voltage you read on the battery does not always immediately indicate what the capacity is left in the battery. When you charge the battery, the voltage can jump up one or two volts. And this might suddenly appear as if the battery is 100% full because the voltage jump up. Therefore, the voltage that you see when you're charging or discharging is not completely indicative of what the capacity is left in the battery. In order to see the true voltage of the battery, you have to disconnect all loads let it rest for like half an hour and then you can take a reading of the voltage and then that voltage will show you what the capacity is left. So if you have this in circuit in a system and you try to read the voltage even though you are using it a little bit because something is plugged in or you are charging it, then you don't actually know the capacity of it just by straight reading the voltage. If you're charging or discharging at a very low rate, you might be able to get away with that, but the state of charge is not gonna be very, very accurate. And at some point in the manual, you're gonna see this little fancy chart here with eight batteries connected together. This is a 20 kilowatt battery bank, which is something I built myself. Let's go take a look at it in my hybrid inverter room. Here's my battery bank, there's eight of them. In order for me to connect all these batteries together, I had to make 16 different cables, two short ones to connect each set right here, two, four, six, Eight. and to connect them in series I need two more here two more here two more here one out of the negative terminal and one out of the positive terminal so 16 cables total each of those cables have an end lug which means I have to crimp 32 lugs I have to buy this shelf here I have yet to buy four straps to secure each set of batteries around the shelf because if you shake it right you don't want it to fall off there's also the issue of protecting all of these terminals from touching this metal shelf. If there's some kind of earthquake, right, you don't want these to touch that. I did buy some silicone covers for it, but I believe that's probably not enough. I need something else to cover it. In the manual, it'll also tell you that every six months, you've got to disconnect everything. You know how much work I had to do in order to just bolt all these things together? It tells you to disconnect it because you need to recharge everything and sync them all. The reason being, as you charge and discharge, these batteries are going to be slightly different in chemistry. Even if they're manufactured at the same time, you bought them at the same time, they're going to become out of sync. And I've had this experience with two of these batteries where I used it for about three or four months. And they differ in voltage, about 0.3 volts at the end. Why do you care about it being synced? Because the inverter that's connected to all of this treats the entire thing like one big battery pack and it expects all of those cell voltages to be synced out of an extreme case. Let's say one of these cells is 
maybe one volt lower in voltage, it's still gonna try to charge the entire bank up to maximum. And when you do this, these might be under voltage and it might charge these other three over voltage. And it's very, very bad to overcharge any kind of lithium iron phosphate batteries. So when it becomes out of sync, you run the danger of overcharging your batteries. So the solution is you put in something like this. It's a battery balancer. It's a passive one and you connect it to all the terminals and it's gonna keep on monitoring the voltage across them. And if one of them happens to be a little high, it's gonna try to dump energy from the higher one into the lower one, thus causing the whole thing to be synchronized at all times. But by the time you do all this, right, there's the cost of all these cables the lugs, the battery balancer, you gotta buy one of these shelves, the silicone terminals, the cost of the straps. And I estimate this to be probably around $300 for all these extra things that you have to buy in order to put eight of these 200 amp hour batteries into one big battery bank. Having done this, I kind of feel it's a lot more elegant if you just buy a server battery rack. Let me pull this server battery back rack over here. And I connected all of this together now. Each shelf is five kilowatts. So five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 kilowatt here in total. The advantage of buying a server battery rack is that internally it already has a battery balancer. You don't have to buy all these wires to connect it yourself. Although if you have, let's say four of these battery racks, right? You still have to connect those together. You still have eight total cables instead of the 16. So a little bit less, but at least you don't have to buy a battery balancer anymore. Usually it comes with a circuit breaker built in. It's also within a nice container. So you're not exposing all these cables. Many times it also has a LCD interface. I'll indicate to you the voltage of each of the cells internally. It might have Bluetooth connectivity. It might have other kind of internet connectivity where you can monitor the battery. You also have the cost of the shelf. I'd say it's around the same price. So if I were to build a battery bank from the ground up, I definitely would go with a server rack, especially if I plan to have like say 20 kilowatts worth of it. Now in what instance would you want to buy these kinds of batteries? Is if your system is 12 volts, then you would buy one of these. If your system is 24 volts, I would try to buy a 24 volt battery that's just pre-built and it's 24 volt itself because it has the battery balancer built in into that battery. However, if you happen to have one of these batteries already, you just need to buy another one. They're a bit smaller. They're about half the size, 50 pounds each. If you don't have space for an entire rack, the racks are enormous. You can't fit it inside a van, but these kind of batteries is a bit more narrow. You can kind of like shove it in in different spaces. Also, they're a bit more granular in terms of upgradability because you can just buy one of them for $500. And let's say later on, you want to add capacity to that. You can buy yet another one, charge them up, string them in parallel, and then you can double your capacity that way. If you already have this kind of battery, let's say you have two of them, and let's say you don't want to sell or discard these batteries completely. You just want to add to your system. Possibly you can buy two more, string them all in series and move to a 48 volt system. If you're building from scratch, and you need at least five kilowatt capacity or more, I would definitely just buy one server rack battery instead. Five kilowatt server rack batteries are quite expensive, over $1,000 each. So if you're not quite yet ready to take the plunge on buying such large capacities, you could most definitely just buy one of these first. Thanks for watching this video. I hope I covered some points that I have never done before. If you guys are interested in this Red Odeo battery, it's one of the more robust ones that I've tested even when comparing to other batteries from the same manufacturer. If you guys are interested in this, check out my affiliate link down in the video description below. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time.